Okay, hey guys, how's it going? My name is Dylan and in this video, I'm gonna interview my dad about some of his photography. He's gonna be sharing what photography means to him, how he got going and talking about a few of the photographs that for him personally mean something. So grab a cup of coffee or a cup of tea and enjoy listening to what he's got to share. Today's video, we're interviewing my dad, Ben Swanepoel. He is the technical advisor for the World Wildlife Conservation Society based in Southeast Asian country of Laos. I've been to visit him a couple of times and really enjoyed the laid back rural nature of the country whose people seem to enjoy life by cooking food, singing karaoke, spending time with family and ending the day off by knocking back a few beer laos on the bank of the Mekong River. Is that... How do you, what do you think of my description of Lao? Yeah, I think that, I think that's pretty much it. There's a, there's a very uh, a sort of famous word they use in Lao called uh, Bopin Yang. Okay. And Bopin Yang basically means everything is uh, no problem, no problem. No problem. And so for, for people in Lao, as long as you've got a couple of beer Lao in the evening, whatever happened in the day, whatever is going to happen tomorrow is Bopin Yang. Yeah. It's no almost, like the, almost like the Timon and Pumba thing, like Kakuna Matata means no worries yeah, exactly yeah exactly that yeah how did you get started in photography so i think for me photography has always been a way of being able to share um experiences that i'm having uh, so very much i always think it like when you're very young um and you do something like you 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 learn something on the swing you're able to like jump off and do a backward somersault or something like that the first thing you want to do is run and say mommy mommy come have a look what i can do and um to me that to me my photography has kind of been an extension of that going through my life so um so i've always tried to live a i've always been very interested in new experiences in life and and the photography for me is a way of being able to say hey look at this look how amazing this is look how um look how interesting this is look how fantastic is that so in a, in a way it's probably a very um what can you say it's a very kind of uh um a personal experience for me photography but it is definitely a way of exp of being able to share my experiences yeah okay so it's it's like documenting your experience through life or and your experiences is that kind of how you, the kind of interest you have in photography? Well, it kind of is that, but of course there's something deeper to that as well. And maybe, you know, maybe initially that's how it kind of starts out. But I think after, after a while, when you look at your photographs, you, I start thinking, okay, I've, I've obviously got a way of looking at life. So when I look in a, if I approach a situation, say for example, it's a, it's a market, like a local Southeast Asian market. Um, uh, Dylan, if you were with me, you would photograph different aspects of that market to what I would aspect uh, that I would take and it's not that your photographs would be better than mine it would be that hopefully that you seen things different differently or seen different things to what I would be seen mm -hmm. and so so I suppose um, more than just documenting my life I'm trying to document what I see in a situation and I think that's more difficult than the photograph. The, you know, the technical taking the photograph is, is, is important and that kind of thing. But the really difficult part is to say, is this picture actually bringing over something unique in the way that I'm seeing something? Um, or is it something that, you know, is the same as everybody else would see? And hopefully there can be some things um, that are unique and, but at the same time, also hold a kind of a shared experience that people can still relate to it. You know? I completely understand that. And it, it has been interesting to see, sometimes I've been on the same job with different photographers and it's, it's always exciting to see um, the, what kind of photographs the other one like, takes of the same event. And um, interesting right. to see, again, like not looking at what's better or worse, just what's the difference and how somebody yes. looked at something with completely differently is always very interesting. Right, right. Yeah. Right. Because because we all interpret, we all interpret um, our lives in a unique way. And so I think the, the, the you know, the, the first prize for me to would be to be able to, for people to be able to see, okay, you see life in this way. And it might even be that you don't even like the way I see life. Um, but that's fine. As long as it's that I can see that you are seeing something different, maybe. Right. You know? okay. And that, that would be kind of the biggest, uh, the biggest kind of, um, not privilege, but the biggest sort of compliment would be, okay, I can see that you seen that in a different way or in a special way, unique way, whatever that is. Yeah. 
So would you say it's almost like for you, it's an extension of how you see, how you see life? You express I that through so. your photography. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. I hope so. That's what I try, and I promise you, I don't always get that right. Um, but the, but the few photo, there are a few photographs that I look at that I can say, yeah, that's how that's me. That is how I would experience something uh, within that situation. Okay, so I think so. This is a photograph I t um, I chose because it was kind of you know from a very early stage in my life. In actual fact, even earlier than this, my dad my dad had a thirty five millimeter film camera. And um, it was a retina, a Kodak retina, and it had a lens that kind of folded in, and then you could like open it and it would come out. So, um, so I had that one, and obviously completely manual, and somehow intuitively I kind of fiddled with the camera, and I started kind of finding um, uh, uh, um, finding settings that would actually take uh, photographs, and and from that I kind of developed a bit of an interest in that, and it was a way of being able to record things. Mm -hmm. And then one of the first cameras I bought when I could actually think about okay I want a camera was called it was a Minolta Weathermatic and it was a very small little yellow waterproof camera and it took it didn't take 30, 35 meter film it actually took um, it was I think it was called 110 uh, film and it was like a little cartridge and it and the photo and the film was like if you imagine a a 35 millimeter uh, um, long um, uh, slide yeah. but then it was only 16 millimeters wide so very very small okay. and but this thing was completely waterproof and so you could so i used to take it when i used to surf and i used to tie i tied the camera to my wetsuit um uh, uh zip yeah. to that you pulled up you know the, the cord that you pulled your zip out i tied it to that and I used to tuck it into the back of my wetsuit mm -hmm. and then i'd paddle out take it out and then take photos and obviously like in those days there was no such thing as gopro or anything like that yeah. and um and and as and my small group of friends that we used, we used to like we were totally like passionate about surfing would have yeah. died to have a photograph of ourselves <laughs> actually surfing and so and so for me to have this camera and I was actually able to take photographs of my friends surfing was like an absolute you know like fantastic thing mm. and so I had this little camera and um, and um, and I used to take some uh, surfing photos of my friends and that, uh, that and in fact I took that camera with me um, when I went sailing across to Saint Helena on a on a sailing boat boat and in those days I mean it was the only camera that you could actually have in a sort of a salt water environment that wouldn't you know within a day or two get completely wrecked mm. and uh, so so this 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 camera always reminds me of because I think it was kind of the first time that I took an active an active step into actually buying a camera that I wanted to and actually trying to you know take photographs that were you know thoughtfully taken mm -hmm. and so so that's why I chose this photograph this photograph was taken at uh, Komaki okay um, uh, I can still remember his name, Donovan. I don't know what he's doing or where he is now, but um, okay. but he was a pretty good surfer. And um, and I was and he, uh, that was forty two years ago. So it was sure. in what nineteen seventy eight. So uh, yeah, forty two years. I was nineteen years old, and um, and yeah, I loved that camera. And in fact, I kept it for many many years until it got stolen out of the out of our car. Um, I think I remember as a, I think I remember as a kid you had. There was one like around the house. It was a yellow thin. Yes, one. that's right. That's right. But a thin yellow. A you can look it up. It's a, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it. I think it was. It was that one. Yes, it got stolen, and okay. then we managed the insurance. Managed. We managed to get it. You know, to replace it. Okay. And then I think eventually it just wore out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. What happened? What happened is they actually stopped making the film. It was a small little uh, film cartridge, okay. and eventually they stopped making it. There wasn't really a demand for yeah. for that film. You know. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. The reason I've taken I've taken this one because the colours look ridiculous. In fact, if you looked at it, you'd probably say, "Wow, somebody really just went over the top on light, on on Lightroom." <laughs> um, but the reality is that there was no processing on this. This is wow. a scan of a um, of a sl of a slide okay. uh, film. Um, so maybe let me just let me just go back a little bit. When yep. I was uh, on my fortieth on my fortieth birthday, my wife at the time bought me for for my birthday a Pentax K1000. Okay. Now, this was the first SLR camera, and in those days, a kind of a professional SLR camera um, that I ever owned, and it was something that it had been a dream of mine to own. 
own a camera and I don't know why it was but I wanted a camera this camera that when you look through the lens there was a split screen and okay. as you turn the lens it would focus and come into focus and there was something magical about this about this kind of camera mm. that or that you could also change lenses the quality of the images the kind of professional look of these cameras and the and the images that they produce was something that I'd always always wanted but it was always beyond my reach because in conservation we you know was always on we were always on the back foot because you never earned a lot of money in conservation and um and uh and as we were married because of the choices we made to homeschool and to do and to live on you know fairly remote protected areas it meant that you know uh, carol couldn't work and so as a result of we lived off like a you know my kind of conservation salary so we always had there was you know there was never the the kind of um the money to be able to buy a camera of that and in those yeah. days i mean you know that was an expensive camera it would be like buying a you know i don't know a canon you know mark four today mm -hmm. you know and um <clears throat> you know comparatively and um and so, and so, um, so Carol had organized this whole like surprise to get me, to get me this uh, camera. And so there it was, it was a beautiful, um, um, Pentax K1000 and, and I started and I shot my first roll of film and, um, just normal film and, um, and that was great, but the colors are very washed up because I didn't really know much. And I was taking, you know, very, on a very dull day and I was using kind of 200, uh, a 200 ASA film, okay. um, and it, you know, there, there was really not there, the photos were not great. And then um, we had a we had a photographer out of my work uh, called Jan van der Pol, but we used to call him Jan van der Camera. Yeah. And um, and he was he was our star photography, and he had and he told me and he kind of took me. He saw I was interested in photography, and then he says, "Yeah, but you should be using um, um, a Fuji Velvia." Okay. And um, but the problem was Velvia is a fifty ASA film, so okay. even if you're shooting in daylight, uh, you have to have a tripod. So if you you know even if you're doing a lands like a landscape in the daylight, if you want to go anything above in broad daylight if you want to go above like 5.6 you need to have a tripod because you're already down to like you know 0.15 of a of a second okay and so um so he said you must get velvia and he gave me a from work he gave me one um spool of uh, of velvia yeah and i put it through the camera and i took this photograph one of the from one of the roles was this um was this photograph and and i had it developed and everything like that and the colors just blew me away i mean the grain is so fine on these 50 asa and the colors are so incredible mm. and i mean to be honest this is what i remember my eyes seeing yes. um during that time because the thing is with velvia or with any with any um uh, slide film is that there's very little latitude so with a lot of the you know black and white film they're called there's a lot of latitude to them the 100 delta 100 400 and that so if you accidentally overexpose it doesn't matter you can still bring it down two or three stops even if you over or underexpose whereas with your film stock if you don't get your exposure right on that's it you've got no chance that you've lost the photograph mm. and so when you do get a photograph that is you think is worth it then you would always bracket you'd always take a photograph and then you would take one above and below your you know what you what your camera was telling you you know just so that you didn't lose that shot and so i think it taught me a lot about photography but the one thing it was a little bit like a drug in that after velvia and after seeing the color represent i couldn't film i couldn't shoot on anything else <laughs> and velvia was so expensive it was so expensive okay. it was i couldn't afford it so it was like in those days it was a hundred rand for a spool okay and you only got 30 so it was 36 film and then you had to still get it developed and you had to buy little slide holders sure. to to cut them up and to put them in the light so all i could afford for one month was 36 uh, was 36 frames so that's okay. all i could shoot every month was a quarter it was 36 frames right so when you can only shoot that then you know how yeah. carefully you look at your photography how much detail you think about you know when you're taking a photograph yeah and i think it was it was uh it was crazy because you know it was uh to be able to limit myself to that kind <laughs> of you know to, to that thing but i think it was a really good teacher because it taught me a huge amount about photography and um and also the excitement of you know of taking your spool and you know when i had a trip to cape town mm. waiting for it to get developed and i used to keep you know you know careful notes of every photograph because by the time i got it back i couldn't remember like what i had even taken yeah so then i had like notes of you know what my what my aperture was and blah 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 blah, blah. and um and that's our film so this is this to me represents a a a uh a very very important part of my photography and mm -hmm. in fact like i've still still the photos that i have out of this period of my life using this camera with velvia uh, 
is probably some of the most special in terms of photography as an actual art form mm. and as a kind of a thoughtful process. We are really, I can look back at this this time and, um, you know, with a lot of fondness. Yeah. Uh, so this was at the Flay, right? At the Whip Nature Reserve, this specific photograph. Yeah, so this photo was on the De Hoop Flay yeah. and um, used to get the most incredible sunsets at times uh, um, on on that um, on mm-hmm. that flay, especially when there were maybe a little bit of smoke in the air or whatever, and there was a little yeah. bit of you know filtration as the sun set because used to get amazing photographs. And like I yeah. say, this it looks like it's over processed, but right. in actual fact, this is what I think. Like that's yeah. how it came. And out. I always would. This is this is this is what my eyes saw, mm-hmm. and I, I remember that. And um, and I think I always look at this photo and I always laugh when. When people say to Choran, "No, no, no! You've coloured, you've coloured the sky wrong. The sky is blue." Well, have uh, a look here and tell me how much blue is in the sky. Right? Yeah, the sky is not always blue, is it? <laughs> it's not always blue. Yeah, that's awesome. Oh, Jan van der Kamer, he, he knew that I was a pauper when it came to when it came to photography. And yeah. what he used to do, he used to uh, for work, they used to bulk roll. Um, they used to bulk bulk roll velvia. So yeah. you'd buy tins of velvia, they would bulk roll it and then keep it in their fridge. Yeah. And so every now and again, I would go past the office on my way down to visit Jan van der Kamera. And he'd come in and he'd see me coming down the, the, <laughs> the corridor and he knew exactly what I was after. And he would get this funny look in his eye and like this irritated look and he would say, <laughs> Ben, he has the key to the film cabinet. I'm putting it up here. And he says, and I just have to go to the toilet quickly. <laughs> and then he'd go out and I would open the fridge quickly, unlock it, and I would grab a handful of velvia. <laughs> and I used to get like about six or seven rolls of velvia. And it was like, it was like, you know, it was really like robbing the bank. Right. And then I'd come home and put it in the fridge. And then I was like sorted for the next month. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So, so this photograph, this is... Um, this is a photograph that um, after I left, um, I left uh, Cape Town to go and work in a very small um, landlocked country of Laos. Yeah. Um, Laos, very, f- very few people um, knew about, know about Laos. Um, all its neighbors are very well known. So you've got Vietnam on the north, you've got Thailand on the south, and the, um, you've got um, Myanmar, um, China, and uh, Cambodia, all surrounding a uh, small country of Laos. Mm-hmm. Very mountainous country, still very remote and very, very uh, conservative in terms of development. It's a, still a, a, a communist-run uh, uh, government, and, um, and so very conservative, but a lovely lovely, lovely uh, country with really beautiful people, really uh, wonderful people. And mm. so I, c- I came over from South Africa to work with a, to work with an NGO to help the Lao government on protected areas management. So they have a number of protected areas, but they really have very, very little. The, the managers don't really know about protected area management. So they need a lot of, you know, support and capacity building and help and that kind of thing. So I came over on a kind of a, just a one year uh, mission to kind of help government to develop some, some models of protected area management. Um, you know, after arriving there, um, the, you know, especially coming from South Africa, the, the, I found the place so kind of peaceful and, and un, um, aggressive okay mm-hmm. um that it's very it was, it was very it was almost instantly i got off i thought to myself you know what i want to actually stay here mm-hmm. and i've and now i've been here now for like 10 years working yeah. here and um and so uh, so the one year turned to 10 years and mm-hmm. um and so the work is actually amazing i mean for me who who really kind of my kind of uh, economy in my life is experiences that's what yes. that's what to me is my kind of in my savings account is you know experiencing things that I have not experienced, that people seldom experience having the opportunity to be in places that maybe people don't often go into. I often think that often think I join conservation more for the privilege of just being able to access areas that are remote areas that you know people just generally don't get into. <laughs> and um, um, but obviously I do have a love and a passion for you know for for things that are natural uh, because I think they are so exciting you know. And um, and so and so I got I've been I got to work in these really remote villages where you would go into a village and the children would actually run away from you and go hide away in different different parts of the village. You know? But then children being children, you know, their kind of curiosity get the most of them and they'd all start gathering around on the corners in the little, small little villages in the houses. Mm. And um, and they'd just start literally just staring at this foreigner, you know, um, this pale faced kind of foreigner. And eventually they would come around and then they would see and it would, and I had a fantastic time and I loved the children. And in this particular instance, it was amazing because we were quite really deep in the forest in an area which was very, very remote. 
uh, only a few hundred uh, uh, people within the small community on a riverbank that you could only get there, um, you know, um, in the dry season, you could only get there in a very, very rough road, or mm. in the rainy season, you could only get there by boat. And so we had this book of all the wildlife animals that should occur in that area, and we would give it to the children and the adults, and they would page through it, and they would point to the animals and say, yeah, 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 they know this one. Mm. This one came to the office, or, or yeah, we don't, we've never seen this one. And from the adults, we would do it with the adults. And they would be have a much. We would get a lot of different kind of information because obviously they're older, and they would tell you of the animals that used to occur there, but that maybe don't occur there anymore. Uh. But the children would kind of be the ones that would be able to tell you the ones that were commonly uh, heard and found around the villages. So by by talking to the children and then the adults and the different groups, you would actually be able to develop a fairly broad understanding of what's around there because forest environment is so different Mm. to savannas that we used to. uh, in that you never see animals, you very seldom see animals. So most of the work is done through camera trapping or mm. uh, signs or talking to villagers, like village interviews as to mm. what's happening. So this was a very, very interesting aspect. And these children, I just loved the, the kind of, um, I love these children because they were so involved in looking at this book. Uh, and I think half of it was the book and the and, and the picture of the animals, but they were getting so excited every time they saw an animal that they knew, you know. Mm. And um, so so this was just one small little snapshot of a number of photos I took of children, um, and it was very difficult making a decision around this photograph because there were so many photos, amazing photos of these children that were just you know sitting in these corners like big groups of children, ten, fifteen, just sitting there sta- staring at me. But the but the the, the look of these children and the kind of uniqueness of each one's of uh, of their personalities and that was just so amazing and to, and it was it was a, a thing that I realized we you know you know being uh, you know, we come from so many different backgrounds and, you know, civilized societies and, and developing countries and that kind of thing. But when you come down to it, we all human, you know, we all have the same, um, there are so many commonalities in us, whether we live in a small forest community or in a, you know, I don't know, like a, a, a house in a small shack in Soweto or a office, you know, like a mm. uh, um, an apartment block in the middle of Santon, you know, we really have so much in common, a lot more than we actually, I think we'd like to admit. Yeah. And so for me, this photograph kind of brought out a lot of that. This is a bit more recent. So this is probably taken about a month or a month, a month or two, uh, yeah, a couple of months ago before the lockdown. Uh, I think it was on my last trip up. And, and the context um, w- where the national park, this huge national park is that I'm working on, um, I go up there for a couple of weeks at a time and then I have to come and work in the Vientiane office for a couple of weeks. Uh, and, um, and so when I go up to him, it's a very different environment. It's a very rural community beautiful people it's really an amazing uh, situation and and like i say it's very quiet it's slow it's quiet and it's rural mm-hmm. and um and 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 in my photography i think you know um i think what i'm trying to what i'm trying to see more and i think it's it's what i'm trying to depict more is what i see in people you know you know there's one thing about landscapes which is you know amazing there's amazing objects you know like some of the temples i take photographs of some of the temples sometimes just because Mm -hmm. there's you know within a fairly kind of bland district the temples are always brightly colored and interesting so mm. i end up taking a lot of photographs because it's because they're attractive you know but um but um but so there's a bit with you know with all the attractiveness of the temples and the objects in the temples of the landscapes which are beautiful uh, everything i like get there's something about people that i that i found find that is so deep and so unfathomable that i think that you can never really you can you can never really get to the end of capturing um people because right. they they just there are just so many facets that I think it's impossible to get bored of catching of, of photographing people I just mm. think it would be I think it must be impossible yeah. and so <laughs> and so what I've been what I find myself being drawn to now is 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 photographing people um, okay. but it's but for me personally I find it extremely difficult because I'm not an intrusive person mm. so by taking photos of people you have to be intrusive and and I really I really have a major problem with that and I walk around literally I'm the type of person that says right I'm going to go out now and I'm going to ask people, I want to take their portrait and I'm going to do it and I promise you I will come back with not having asked a single person. So that's who I am, right? right? So I'm unfortunately or fortunately, I'm not sure which, I'm having to limit myself to the people that I know well. Okay. And, um, 
and and this person here is uh, is uh, Moore. Now Moore is a Hmong is a Hmong person, and he works for us. He is a livelihoods officer, so he helps communities. He helps us develop activities for communities to develop. Uh, so, okay, let me say that again. Uh, what we try and do, so like a lot of the villages uh, around the protected areas, they still hunt extensively in the protected areas, collect uh, fruit and berries and timber and everything, not to buy another cell phone or to buy a second car or, or a house in the country, mm -hmm. but just to be able to put food on the table, right? So so for us to come in as conservationists and say, okay, you know, you know, animals are so beautiful and for our future generation is absolutely meaningless. And so like it doesn't mean anything. People are trying to live. People are trying to, to trying to survive. So the only way that we can make any kind of meaningful contribution is to is to provide an alternative to villagers than go into the forest and hunt wild animals. Mm. Okay, so if we can provide and say, look, we'll help you to develop a coffee industry. And if you de if we develop a coffee industry that is wildlife friendly, organic, people will pay money for that in the West. And then you will earn more money than you are currently, you know, by hunting, you know, it's wildlife for okay. very, very little bit of money or to supply a Vietnamese trader who takes off and makes a fortune, you yes. know, in another country. So Moor, Moor is our key person in helping villagers to develop these kind of livelihood activities. Okay. So I've been working with Moor now for, you know, for a couple of years. And when I was up there, his, his, uh, one of his family members had a, had a Buddhist ceremony to, uh, to it's kind of what we would call a baptismal uh, a baptism mm -hmm. of a child, except yeah, you know it's a much more difficult. The, the the traditions in the Buddhist kind of traditions are actually a lot more lighter and a lot more kind of fun mm. than the than the Christian things that I remember anyway. Okay. <laughs> ours were very serious and everything like that. Yeah, yeah. everybody gets together and they all uh, drink beer and uh, party <laughs> and eat a lot of food and get together and just have a really nice time. Yeah. And um, and so this was just at one of the of one of these kind of ceremonies and I just uh, he there was a moment where he was talking to his to his daughter and there was something in the way that he was listening mm. um, and the way that she was speaking that just spoke to me that spoke to me of um, of their relationship, you know. Mm. Um, now, yeah, now, not not all fathers have a close relationship with their children, especially here in Asia, where where like Moore works, he works permanently away from home. His mm. family are in Vientiane, and he works up in Hiem, which is about you know a two day drive. Okay, and so he's up there for most of the year, and he visits his family a few times a year. And this is not unusual. It's, mm. it's un it would be very unusual for us in the West, but in this area, it's not unusual at all. You go where the work is. Mm -hmm. Your family stays in the village you go where the work is and right. and so Moore is which is quite unusual but then the Hmong communities are very very family orientated he has opted to bring his daughter with him to work okay. and so he's so his daughter stays with a relative in him and he looks after her and oh, and somehow the photograph the photograph here kind of depicts mm. a much closer father-daughter relationship okay. than you would see in a normal family, you know, that are all living together every day, just doing the day-to-day -day things, daddy's going to work and that kind of thing. And I mean, you know, and again, I, I can't honestly say that I saw this all taking place and then took the photo to encapsulate this amazing mm. thing, you know. I did see a moment and yeah. I took a photograph of that moment, um, but, it, but, but the way that it came out, and to me, the way that photography comes out should always be a surprise. I think mm. if you're able to predict to such a level, you know, the, 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 I don't think it's possible to, to predict to that level of when that moment, that specific moment is going to take place. You right. know? And so, so I think photography in a way is you present the camera with an opportunity to catch something, yeah. but I don't think it always does. Yes. And I think in this case it did. Right. Yeah. No, that's awesome. It's, it's a very beautiful picture. So, 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 I mean, for me, if, if I can get more photos like this, mm -hmm. if I can get more photographs that, that invoke some kind of emotion, Mm. Um, then that's better than the emotion that a sunset invokes, you know. 100%. And, you know, you post a photo of a sunset on Instagram and you're guaranteed to get the highest photo, you know, um, uh, like count, you know. Yeah. Uh, you post something like this, you get a few, oh, isn't she sweet? Yes. But, uh, but you don't really get the, 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 you don't get it. You don't get that, but that's fine because this is really what I want to capture. This right. is the emotion that to me is worth, you know, any thousand uh, sunsets. Yeah, no, for sure. 
I think that's what I want to do with these. That's exactly why I want to do this kind of interview is to talk about these kind of things that maybe somebody who just sees it, oh, that's cute, and they move on. But there's like so much more to it than than that. Okay, so this one is a little bit different to my normal kind of uh, uh, way of shooting. And um, I think it also comes, this is, it probably comes a little bit from, uh, uh, from being older. Um, and uh, I don't know whether it's from being older or maybe just a different way of, of starting to look at, at look at things. But um, I suppose in a way it's trying to have a look at something uh, in a different way. So, so normally, yes, you can look at a different perspective. So you can go up, you know, or you can, you can, um, you can be like higher than your object or you can be lower. And there's many different ways of finding a different perspective mm. uh, for your photography. Okay. Um, but sometimes that's difficult. So after many, many years, you know, if you're going to see a street, you know, a street scene, you should try and get a bit lower down. Um, you know, uh, there's all different kind of perspective and, you know, some of the rules and that kind of thing. And, um, but, but I wanted to kind of see something a little bit deeper. And, and so I started experimenting with like taking my camera and just like shaking it uh, when um, into a different scene. And I did it to a couple of scenes and I was actually quite amazed at the results. And some of the, some of the photographs that, I, that I've done doing this, especially at the temples where you've got like a, you know, like there's a, a Buddha or something like that. And you do take the normal photograph and it's beautiful, clear. But then when you do the, when you, when you move and create some movement, movement in the photograph yeah uh, I don't know it kind of brings out a different dimension and, mm. and there's actually a lot more than you can that you can actually uh, read into it's almost like a different dimension of the same yes. photograph so I can have a photograph of this particular this little right shelter here um, which is but then this this now by just doing this kind of shaking thing it gives it it gives you a different perspective and mm -hmm. for me anyway I look at this photograph more than I would if it was perfectly in focus you know um, you know perfectly in focus and everything like that yes. I look at this more I notice more I think more about about the scene I think of why it's there you know the um, I can see there's mountains in the background mm. um, but it's taken but for me anyway it takes me beyond the image Okay. You know, it, uh, uh, so it takes me beyond the image, and and I really like that, and I mm. get surprised at the images that I get out of this method, and so I've liked. Um, I, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't work on everything, and it's not something that you do all the time. But there are definitely times when I'm taking photographs where I switch over and I do something like this, and even the even the the act of the way that you move the camera mm -hmm. is kind of autistic, you know? And okay. I kind of, you know, I kind of get into, <laughs> it sounds weird, but I kind of get into yeah. like an autistic, it's like a painter with a painter brush and he might flick the colors onto the onto right. the canvas, you know, and then like, you know, um, and then kind of, you know, flick them around and stand back. And for me, it's kind of, it's kind of, because I'm, I'm not, I don't have the, um, I don't have the talent of a of a painter or an, or an artist in that way. Um, for me, in the photography, it's a similar way. The way that I move the camera mm -hmm. in a way is a brush, and it does paint a different picture. You know, the picture I see here is a different picture to what I would normally take, and I really like that. Mm. Uh, I don't always, you know, I don't always. It doesn't always work on everything, uh, yeah. but on some of the things, it works look really really well you know mm. and again because of only you know selected a very few photographs only five photographs you know i could show you a range of these kind of photographs where where they really where it really does do an amazing um you know where, where something quite amazing comes from it mm. so it's a little bit more abstract and and maybe at this stage of my life or whatever it is i like it i, I like the i like the experimenting i like the ethereal kind of more spiritual uh, kind of um feel that I get from doing this kind of photography you know so so I think what I'm saying what I'm also saying by this is that um you know um I, I realize that it's never too late to kind of be experimenting to try new things to not just get used to the same way of doing things that you can look at life in a different way and it's never too late to start looking at life from different perspectives <laughs> yeah I like what you said about that it's like the, usually the camera you uh the camera like shows a perspective and a specific area where now the camera is also part right. of, in a sense, like painting it or creating it because yes. of just the movement of it does something. So there's, there's like an extra element where normally there's just two, exactly. right? It's, it, it's the angle 
and the perspective up down left right but now there's a third one which is also the movement of it yes exactly and then and then if you put all that together you get then a a more kind of ethereal kind of spiritual um, feeling or um, or it makes you think differently when you look at the photograph and um, you know if it, if it can get people if I can get myself to look differently to look at things differently then that's then I think that's great you know uh, the other thing also I wanted to say also is that if you look at all the, fo the photos I've taken so far, I think any, any of the photos could have been taken with any camera. I don't think there's any specific, you know, like this is this kind of photograph um, you can take with uh, you can take with with any camera because it doesn't have to be sharp. <laughs> you right. don't have to have, you know, super high ISO. You don't have to have anything like that. You can take it with yes. a very basic camera. In fact, probably the more basic, the easier, more easier it is to get <laughs> this kind of thing. Because right. if you've got a camera that's like got a very, very, you know, um, uh, it's actually quite difficult if you don't have an ND filter to actually get this kind of shake in broad daylight, you know. Yes. So better to have a slower lens. Right. <laughs> better to have a slower <laughs> lens. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure all like the artifacts of a lens, like the things that are like wrong with it, end up adding to the photograph. Like if it's not yes, exactly, yeah, hundred percent sharp. If there's a bit of a weird lens flare, it actually adds to the photograph as opposed to takes away from it. No, it's exactly. I mean, why do Fuji have film simulations? You know, they have this mm -hmm. load of film simulations that people love, um, because it's, it it simulates something that wasn't perfect. You know, mm -hmm. film and the different grains and that were not perfect. They had idiosyncrasies. They were difficult to shoot. They became grainy, and yeah. because of that, often images had a lot more character. You know, mm -hmm. so if it's just about pixel peeking to find out is it absolutely hundred percent sharp on the corner? Is it actually thing? It's so far removed from what I imagine makes a photograph moving. I, I find, yes. I don't know how many people get moved by looking at a photograph because it is 100% sharp at the corners, <laughs> or do you get moved at the photograph by the photograph because of the image that is presenting? Yeah. And if, if it's the image is presenting, I think it, if it was taken with a cell phone or taken with a, you know, with the most latest camera, I don't think it actually mm. makes all that much difference. I mean, I do think that there is a technical uh, skill to develop, um, which can even produce something like this. I mean, you do know right. the photograph that I've taken here. You do know how to, you have to know how to generate that. So you do have to know a little bit of photography to do that, yes. you know, but, um, but, but it is so much more important what you actually take in the photograph of uh, that that if you take in a photograph of some amazing um, emotion that's taking place really the secondary thing is you know color uh, shift or um, yeah. or uh, I don't know you know all the pixel you know peeping and that kind of thing it's yes. just so secondary it is so secondary yes and the only time it's really primary is if the only thing that is important is the image you know if that right. is everything sure then that is everything you know yes um and it's like, it's wonderful to do that. When I when I did um, when I was shooting with my Belvia, the, you know the the film camera, um, I had to do that. It was a fantastic feeling to go into the mountain mm -hmm. with half my camera bag with camera equipment because yeah. everything was so heavy, and then to put a tripod down to think about the photograph, you yeah. know, set everything up, um, put a cable release in, um, you know, take the photograph and think about it, okay, is this right, is everything right, and then take the photo. It's incredibly therapeutic, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, wonderful for that time period, you know. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, that all those kind of photos are terrible. I'm just saying what I'm saying is that, you know, there they, they are different ways of, of – of looking and seeing, and you know there isn't one that's right and one that's that's wrong. You know. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, that's cool. Now, thanks, Dad, yeah. for sharing all that. And I mean, again, in the same way that these are only five photographs of a lot that you could have shared, there's also still a lot you could be talking about with, you know, your view of photography or all these different sure. things that can go on for. Sure for hours and I think in a sense that's what makes it so interesting in the same way that you can talk about it for a long time there's still so much you can experience of it still in the future that's innocent that's unknown or um, and that's what's so enjoyable I suppose about doing things that are creative because there's no end to it there's no uh, there isn't a boundary and there's there's just an endless amount of things that you can do 
And if it is a part of your life, then um, then it is a part of your life in the same yeah. way as music can be a part of your life. And there are songs that you will remember that you took that that you listened to many years ago, which will which will evoke an emotion. You know? Yeah. And you don't sit and say that this song was better than this song. Um, yeah. It was a song which which ev evoked an emotion, a memory, a yeah. maybe even a complete change in your life. And the same can be with literature mm -hmm. and, you know, photography, everything. You know, if, you, if it's part of your life and it's part of your, of your, you know, part of your journey, mm -hmm. then, you know, then these images are represent moments in that, in that time, which is, which is a wonderful, which is a wonderful way of capturing yeah. a memory. You know, some people are really gifted in writing and they're able to do it in writing. You know, I think yes. with photography, it does open it up for the average person to be able to capture these memories uh, in a in a quite a profound way mm -hmm. and you don't have to be an amazing artist um, you know to be able to catch a, to be able to capture these you can you know it does it does kind of open up a an art to the common man as it were you know to be right. able to to be able to document and experience life in the way that they that you are experiencing it cool thanks guys for watching hope you enjoyed that video I have added his Instagram and his website in the links below and be sure to go take a look and see some of his other work. Cool, I'll check you guys in the next video.